Hi folks, in today's lesson we're going to look again at Judith Butler's gender performativity and try to clarify some common misconceptions about their theory of gender performativity. The two common misconceptions that I'm interested in are these. The difference between performance and performativity, and the difference between gender and sex. This video is only going to talk about the first one. In short, what Butler wants to say about performance and performativity is that they're actually not the same. And as a preview for the next video, what Butler wants to say about gender and sex is, I hope surprisingly, that they're not as distinct as you might think they are. But let's just stick to the first one, because I think that deserves some of our time. So, to recall what Judith Butler might say in an interview trying to clarify this distinction between performance and performativity, this is what they say. It's one thing to say that gender is performed, and that's a little different from saying gender is performative. When we say gender is performed, we usually mean that we've taken on a role, we're acting in some way, um, and that our acting or our role playing is crucial to the gender that we are and the gender that we present to the world. To say that gender is performative is a little different because for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that mm, consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. Okay, so we might summarize Butler's account of the difference between performance and performativity in this way. Butler says, when we say gender is performed, we mean that we're acting in some way. However, Butler's theory is not of gender performance, it's of gender performativity. They clarify, for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. I think this is a really useful way of starting to make the distinction between the two, but I don't quite think it's enough for us to understand. So that's what I'm going to try to do in this video, is to clarify what they mean here um, in this fairly plain spoken introduction to the distinction between performance and performativity. So to help us out, I'm going to once again call on our friend Zach Efron as an interlocutor with Butler who has read Butler, has done the homework, but doesn't quite understand the difference between performance and performativity. So Zach might say, okay, Butler, so when you say gender is performative, you just mean that I perform masculinity, just like I perform roles when I'm acting. Not quite, Zach, says Butler. Wait, I thought your whole thing is that gender is just one big performance, all the world's a stage and all that. Butler might say, I never said that. If I did, then you might think that you can just put on your gender in the way that you can just put on a costume. Wait, I thought that's what you were arguing. Didn't you say that gender is like drag? Everybody gets this wrong. Let me explain. And indeed, Butler's famous analogy between what gender is and drag performance has produced a lot of confusion about the specificity of what Butler means by gender performativity. And in 1993, Butler wrote a different book called Bodies That Matter, in which the opening, the preface of the book, has some clarification of Butler's actual point in their previous book, the famous one, 1990s Gender Trouble. So this is what they say. For if I were to argue that genders are performative, that could mean that I thought that one woke in the morning, perused the closet or some more open space for the gender of choice, donned that gender for the day, and then restored the garment to its place at night. Certainly such a theory would restore a figure of a choosing subject, humanist, at the center of a project whose emphasis on construction seems to be quite opposed to such a notion. Gender is not an artifice to be taken on or taken off at will, and hence not an effect of choice. So I want you to dwell on that last part here. Gender is not an artifice to be taken on or taken off at will, hence not an effect of choice. So remember that Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity is often associated with what we might call a social constructivist theory of gender. A theory that puts a lot of weight on the ways in which social conventions construct this very phenomenon that we're calling gender. Butler points out that if they are indeed a social constructivist, why would so many people misinterpret their theory of gender as putting so much power in the agency of a human subject, right? Social construction emphasizes all the ways in which society imposes things on us. 
not the ways in which we are completely free agents who choose everything that we do, including our gender. So now Zac Efron has done this extra homework reading, and he's a little more clear on what this all means. He says, ah, okay, gender isn't a performance because it's not done willfully or consciously in the way that Zac performs the roles in his movies and television shows willfully and consciously. But then Zach says, hey, I looked up performative in the dictionary, and the first definition is, quote-unquote, relating to or of the nature of dramatic performance. Butler might say, did you see any other definition, Zach? Zach, of course, did see another definition, but he didn't want to use that one because it was too confusing. But in fact, it's this other definition that matters. Here's that definition of performative that Butler is actually working with being or relating to an expression that serves to affect a transaction or that constitutes the performance of the specified act by virtue of its utterance. Yep, that's the one, that's the one definition of performative that Butler is in fact working with, but notice that it's quite difficult. So we're gonna have to work through what that means. So Butler's gonna help out Zach because he doesn't know what this means. So where you get this definition of performative comes mostly from this philosopher of language named J.L. Austin, a mid-century philosopher of language that Butler has been inspired by. And the main concept that you can associate with J.L. Austin is what he calls performative utterances, sentences which not only describe a given reality, but also change the social reality that they are describing. So what's an example of, of a performative utterance for Austin? Things like this. I bet you $100 that I can make this basket. In saying the sentence, I bet you $100 that, I am in fact doing the action that we call betting. Or saying, I do at a wedding. Or saying, I do at a wedding. It's not just a description of my feeling. It also is itself an act that authorizes the action of getting married. Or, and this is my favorite example, I promise to. When I say the words I promise to, I am in fact doing the action that we call promising. There is no way to distinguish between the action of promising in the world and the speech act of saying I promise to. A, a simpler example might be I apologize, right? When you say I apologize, you are in fact doing the action called apologizing, or even I accept your apology. Right? The action of accepting one's apology is indistinct from the speech act, I accept your apology. So this might seem banal and ordinary, right? an ordinary distinction to make about language. But keep in mind that Austin's trying to show us that language isn't just a describing thing. Right? Sentences like, the cat is on the mat, do the kind of thing that we usually associate with language. Right? Describe things in the world. The cat is on the mat. But Austin is trying to show us that there's another kind of speech act that doesn't describe but performs, or rather brings into existence the very thing that it seems to describe. I promise to. So, Zach Efron has just learned about J.L. Austin, and he says, okay, I now understand what performative means in terms of language, but what does this have to do with gender? So you know how a promise, Butler says, only exists through the act of saying, I promise? Yeah, that's what makes it a performative utterance. I get that. Right, a promise isn't some concrete thing in the world that we describe. Rather, it's brought into existence through the act of saying, I promise. It's the same with gender. Okay, Zach is trying to get it, and he says, okay, so are you saying that manness only exists in the act of saying, I am a man? Right, analogous to, to a promise only existing through the act of saying, I promise? This is not quite what Butler is saying. I don't mean to say that gender is a performative utterance, that it's brought into existence only through language. I mean that gender is performative in the way that performative utterances are performative. Zach is starting to understand. Okay, right. And performative utterances are speech acts whose existence comes from nothing but the act of speaking. Butler might add, and from the authority granted the speaker by social conventions, and not much else. I only, believe, I only believe that a promise is made in the act of saying, I promise, because I live in a social world where such a convention is recognized by everybody. 
That is, everybody who speaks that language. Zach says, ah, and so gender, like a promise, only exists through the various acts that make it up, like ways of moving, speaking, dressing. And here we might return to one of the most important sentences from Judith Butler's Gender Trouble. Gender is the stylized repetition of acts through time. The most important term here is act. That's what ties gender to performativity. Butler says, right. And this is all held together through social convention. Just like saying, I promise, only brings a promise into the world because of mere social convention. Okay, Zach says, I think I get it. Butler is not happy. Show me that you do. Be a good student. Show me that you understand. So let's give Zach a chance. Zach writes this on the board. Performance means conscious and deliberate artifice, as in a stage play. But performativity is the idea that actions in the world, speech, nonverbal bodily movement, clothing, etc., create this thing called gender just as performative utterances create things through speech, such as promises. And here we can start to understand more difficult, complex sentences in gender trouble that explain what performative means. So on page 185, towards the end of Butler's text, Gender Trouble, they say that the gendered body is performative suggests that it has no ontological status apart from the various acts which constitute its reality. Notice that this definitional sentence does nothing to do with putting on a stage play or consciously performing a part. What it's saying is that there is no ontological, or in other words, essential, biological, natural status of gender apart from the various acts in the world, the ways we move, the ways that we speak, the ways that we dress, right? Stuff that we can see and hear that constitutes the reality of this phenomenon that we're calling gender. That's what it means to say that gender is performative. Another sentence in the same chapter, because there is neither an essence that gender expresses or externalizes, nor an objective ideal to which gender aspires, and because gender is not a fact, the various acts of gender create the idea of gender. And without those acts, there would be no gender at all. So once again, what makes gender performative? Not that it is a performance as if on a stage play, but that what makes gender is actions in the world. And that's it. And the conventions in society that tie those kinds of actions to particular genders that normative culture agrees upon, like being a man or being a woman. Okay, I hope that has clarified an important but fairly difficult and complex distinction between performance and performativity. I'll see you next time for more common misconceptions in Judith Butler. Thanks.